A good morning to you all. Thank you very much for joining this uh, Keto Pen Fattening webinar. My name is Rollings and I'm with Agri Business Media, which is um, a parent company with uh, the largest farmer audience in the country, under which you find the Agri Business Magazine, which is our free publication. We also have the Agri Business Directory which is an annual free digital publication. We uh, also have the online agribusiness television, which is hosting uh, these weekly webinars. So the other wing that we have is agribusiness talk, which runs our social media platforms. So farmers, we encourage you to take advantage of these free platforms to uh, learn more information on the business of uh, farming at no cost. So if you are looking for information on the business of cattle pen fattening, you are in the right place. So welcome to the business of cattle pen fattening webinar. So we are starting in a minute. Thank you. So once again, welcome to uh, the business of cattle pen fattening webinar. We are also broadcasting live on our Facebook uh, page which is agribusiness media reason why we are doing this webinar is to give specialists from different organizations to share their experience uh, business and technical information as well as management uh, practices that will help you farmers in the migration from subsistence to commercial so this webinar has been made possible by cooper's animal health zimbabwe and uh, cooper zimbabwe is a truly Zimbabwean animal health company that has been servicing this agricultural industry for more than 75 years. So Cooper's Animal Health Zimbabwe is proud to continue providing the best solutions to the challenges faced by all farmers, both in, in the country and also in the region. And this is through excellent care and appropriate advice. So we will definitely share the Cooper's Animal Health page, uh, Facebook page, and social media links in the chat section. So pen fattening is also known as feed lotting. It involves feeding of beef cattle with a protein balanced high energy diet for a period of about 70 to 120 days under conf confinement. And this is meant to increase uh, weight and also to improve uh, quality to ensure that when you go to the markets, uh, you get better grades and also uh, more revenue for, for your farm business. So there's a lot involved in cattle pen fattening, and it's not just a matter of uh, feeding cattle to, to gain weight. So this webinar is going to zero in on all the key areas from the farm to the market. So how the webinar is going to unfold uh, this webinar sponsored by Cooper's Animal Health Zimbabwe is we are going to have an informative uh, discussion with great presentations from Dr. Oswin Choga representing Cooper's Animal Health. We we'll also have uh, Junior Manduna from the Agricultural Marketing Authority. Then Mark Eita is with CC Sales Zimbabwe. Blantina Mutago, she's with National Foods stock feeds. Then we have Mark Benzon, is the team leader with the Beef Enterprise a Strengthening and Transformation Project under the Zimbabwe Agricultural Growth Program. Then we also have Onyas Mutetwa, is also with uh, the BEST project and is the private sector engagement specialist. We also have another great presentation from Tamarin Tlanga, She's with uh, the Agribusiness Division of the People's Own Savings Bank, POSB. So we welcome you to the program, all our presenters. So we'll give farmers and other participants that are joining a chance to ask you questions. And this has been built in the uh, program. So to allow for a smooth transition between the presenters, we will have a question and answer section after all presenters. So if you have a question, just type in in that section. And if you are watching live on Facebook, just type in your, your, your question uh, in the comment section. We have excellent experts today 
will attend to all your questions. So we are starting off with uh, Dr. Osmin Choga. Uh, he's from Coopers Animal Health, the sponsors of this webinar. His presentation is on animal health and uh, he's, uh, he's got 15 minutes. Uh, Dr. Osmin Choga, you can go for it. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll firstly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ozun Choga, and I'm the technical advisor for Coopers. Uh, and I'm going to be presenting on um, the induction program, which we recommend for sand fattening. Um, let me just try to share my screen again. Yes, you should be able to share now, uh, Doc. Yeah, I'm not able to do that. Uh, thank you. Um, so I, I hope you can all see my, my screen now. Yes, yes. All right. That's good. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to be presenting on, in, on an induction program for cattle fattening. Um, so I'll start uh, by talking about the, the phases that you go through, because there are specific things that you need to abide with um, from an animal health point of view uh, when you when, when, when you're wanting to get your animals into the feedlot, um, and this will ensure maximum productivity. So basically there are two phases um, that, that we recognize um, uh, of induction. And the first phase is the gate phase. So the gate phase basically looks at the um, things that you do as, as, as you take in your, your cattle, like, just after purchasing or bringing in your, your, your own cattle from your own head into the feedlot. And the gate phase uh, particularly takes between one and five days. And I'm going to be expurgating on this in my next present, in my next uh, um, slides. Uh, then the other phase is adaptation or acclimatization phase. And uh, for me, this is one of the most important um, phases. Um, second to the to the gate phase and i'm sure my colleagues from national foods who also will be able to explain further on it but i'll, I'll, I'll just uh, try to introduce it to everyone so that um, at least you, you get to understand uh, the implications from an animal health point of view um, then uh, so i'll start with the gate phase so the gate phase it it it, it looks at the procedures uh, that are done on arrival, um, either uh, from a purchase or from a sale. Um, if the animals on your on your farm, um, it may not always be necessary. Um, and I'll explain why. So um, basically, the, the first stage is identification of animals, and uh, by identification we mean the the tagging of animals because you need to be tracking uh, the weight gains. Uh, so that at least you know what sort of management uh, to, to, to carry out on the different animals. Um, then the second uh, thing is external and internal parasite control. Uh, and this basically looks at the control of ticks um, and also uh, worms, which have got a negative um, impact on the weight gains of animals as, as soon as they get into the feedlot. And also the general disease control. Uh, and the assumption here is that most of the animals, as they get into the feedlot, um, if they are in what we call the incubation period, which is the period between um, infection and, um, and, and, and the point at which we start seeing the clinical signs or the clinical disease, it usually takes about two weeks. So if you buy any animal which is within that, that space, uh, you won't be able to actually identify whether it has disease or it doesn't. And this also explains certain things that are recommended, particularly on farms, when you buy your cattle, uh, such as um, quarantine. Uh, but I would assume uh, it may not be very important for, for feed lotting, unless if you're using your animals and animals that you will have bought outside. Okay, so I'll start on tick control. So in terms of um, tick control, um, animals from the different areas 
uh, usually come with varying tick infestations. Um, and uh, what I would call challenges was right now we've got a very big problem with blue tick resistance. Um, and our target in the animal health industry is to make sure that we don't get translocation of um, resistant blue ticks from one farm to the other. Um, and I'll explain how we, 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 we avoid that. So the animals, as soon as they get, they, 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 they get into the feedlot, they are supposed to be dipped and sprayed with an, an effective dip on arrival. Um, and I would recommend uh, the usage of dips like um, um, your synthetic pyrethroids, um, organophosphates, and what we call amidins. And examples of these are super deep um, triatics or decatics. And there's also a poron which is got spot on, particularly when you know that they're heavy rains. We recommend the usage of uh, those four on dips. Then, in the case of blue tick resistance, we recommend uh, the usage of uh, what we call macrocyclic lactons or avamectins, uh, like um, bimectin in our case. If you look at this uh, image that I put on my slide on the right corner, um, so from a feedlotting point of view, um, if you look at this picture that I'm projecting right now, um, from research, 22 engorged, um, engorging bond ticks on, on, a, on a cow per day result in, in cows in a loss of 20, 20 kgs uh, in body weight. Then in cows, 11 kgs. And in cows, it could also be seen as a, um, a loss in production where they are actually not gaining weight. Okay, then I move on to the next subject, which is uh, worm control. So this is uh, one of the most important things um, uh, to be done as you get your animals into the feedlot because of the impact of, um, of worms, or which I'm going to show you, or internal parasites. And the majority of the animals that are purchased for feedlotting might, might never have been dosed, depending on the area, particularly if you're getting your animals from communal areas, uh, because of the knowledge gap uh, that's available in, in the communal areas, you, you get to see that most of them, they're actually still using traditional methods to, 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 to raise their animals. So they actually don't consider worm control as, a, as an important issue because it doesn't cause mortality um, immediately. Um, so worms of concern would be mainly your round worms, uh, liver and conical fluke. And I've deliberately left out the tapeworms because tapeworms are mainly an issue uh, to pre-winning cows. Um, then from research, we've seen that an infestation of 200 flukes, this is just as an example. Um, so an infestation of 200 flukes per cow can cost, for, cost up to, to, to 28.5 reduction in average daily gain. So let's say your animal is supposed to, to be gaining um, let's say maybe two kgs for ad argument sake. So that will mean that you, you, you it, it, it will actually be gaining 1.4 kgs instead of the, um, the, the, the actual two kgs. So you can see that loss. And if you calculate it backwards um, to the profits that you get at the end, um, it means that you may actually cut uh, your bottom line as a result of that. Then the above challenges can be addressed by products which we have at Coopers, and uh, these include um, System X Plus, um, News and Drench, uh, or you could use uh, Biomectin Plus, which I, I would say it will be, um, it's a three in one because it controls, it controls the blue ticks, external parasites, plus um, the, the liver fluke and, and the roundworms, which we are concerned um, about in this case. Um, then the other um, issue, which is also of importance from an animal health point of view, is disease control. And if you remember, in my first few, few, few slides, I spoke about the, um, the fact that most of the animals may actually be within their incubation period or the period between um, infection and the point at which we can see observable clinical signs. So that means you may. In, in, in our minds, we have concluded that these animals are actually 
uh, not sick. So because of that, the specific things that we're supposed to do. Uh, so before we actually bring in animals into a feedlot or purchase animals, we, 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 we carry out what, what I would call a pre-purchase examination where we identify if there are any, any disease conditions that that animal has. Uh, because if we don't do that, we get into a situation where that animal may end up spreading disease to the other animals in the feedlot, uh, which will reduce production, number one, and number two, which may actually result in mortalities, uh, which would mean losses to the farmer who's involved in the feedlotting. Um, then another thing that also happens as a result of feedlotting was um, in the case of feedlotting, most of these animals, they are coming from different areas. Um, there will be stress of transportation. And when we look at, our, at cattle, um, in the natural environment, they are used to grazing. So now we have changed their diet um, and we've put them in a very small space. And this actually results in, in, in a level of stress, which, which we, we have seen that it can be managed within the first five days. So during that period, because of that stress, those animals, they actually become immunocompromised or they, they can't actually resist any form of disease. And uh, one other fact that I want you to note is that for most of the cattle in Zimbabwe, um, there are actually carriers of diseases like gall sickness. And um, because of that, we have to take specific actions, uh, like the injection of oxytetracyclines. Uh, for example, um, cupamycin LA, which you can see on the right side of the slide. Um, and during this period, we also don't encourage farmers to vaccinate their animals, because if they vaccinate their animals, those animals may actually succumb to, 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 the, um, to the infection. Uh, uh, because one thing that, that I would want you to understand is that vaccinations are just weakened forms of disease. Um, so, so, so if we vaccinate within the gate phase, which is the first five days, uh, first three to four days, I would say, um, that may mean that the animals may actually not, no, 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 not, not seroconvert or not gain immunity, uh, or they may succumb to an infection. Um, I hope that's clear enough. Um, then I move on to the last component, uh, which are the vaccines that we recommend in, in feedlotting. So we basically recommend uh, the vaccination with botulism, anthrax, and black like. And these three, uh, they, they can come as a combination, uh, which is called three in one, uh, which means you can actually vaccinate against this. And usually the first vaccination that we do, we do it on day five. Um, and the reason why we vaccinate against this particularly is that for botulism, um, in some fields they use uh, chicken droppings. So there's exposure to botulism because it's usually found in decomposing uh, material. Um, then anthrax is key to be controlled because whenever, if an outbreak comes, it will literally clear all the animals within a short time without showing any pre-monetary uh, clinical signs. Then black leg, we believe that it's a disease of animals that are in good condition. And because we are pen fattening, these animals are definitely going to get into good condition and exposing them to the risk of uh, black leg. I'm not going to get into the um, nitty gritties of these diseases because of uh, our, our time. Um, then another disease that we also vaccinate against is lumpy skin. And lumpy skin, we see it um, in the form of, it, it, the animals will have uh, even, evenly distributed lumps uh, on their body. Um, then I move on to the next, next uh, stage or next phase. Um, so the next phase is uh, acclimatization. So acclimatization um, usually takes between 10 to 14 days. And within this period, the animals are basically adapting to the new forms of diet. And what's important at this stage is to, is, is to, is to give them as much roughage as possible, uh, in addition to the, to the feed, uh, according to the recommendations to the feed companies. And uh, this is really important because um, the roughage is very important in, in saliva production. 
Um, and it, during this period, we have to go through a, a transition where, 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 where there is slow introduction of the um, high energy diet. And this allows adaptation of the ruminal flora. Because when you look at the um, ruminant stomach, it's, it, it is mainly comprised of bacteria and protozoa that are res responsible for, for digesting uh, the feed. And also, uh, uh, they're also important in, in, in protein synthesis and um, other things like that. So you get to see that initially, because these animals were on a, um, on a pasture, on, on pastures, they will have more of uh, the, um, the bacteria that break down what we call cellulolytic bacteria that break down the, the high fiber um, and less of the bacteria that are responsible for breaking down the, 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 the high energy, which is coming from the feed companies. And another thing that I would recommend in terms of uh, acclimatization during the acclimatization period is to observe uh, the different ages, genders and sizes which is where weighing your animals before they get into the feed loop becomes important. So that at least there, is no, there are no issues like bullying um, and, and things like that. And clean water is also mandatory. Uh, so I'll, I'll just zoom in on, on, on blot. So if you look at this picture that I put on the um, right side of the slide, um, this is a picture of animals that are at different levels of blot. So what happens when we start feeding high, high energy diet uh, without uh, appropriately following the acclimatization um, principles is that the animals then produce a lot of gas. They produce a lot of gas and this gas results in what we call tympani. And because the, as, as the bacteria break down the, um, the high energy diet, there's also uh, an increase in acid production, which is not usually the normal case when they are on pastures. So this then results in, um, in, 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 in lack of motility, what we call atony of the rumen. And with, with the accumulation of fluid, the fluid will then, not, will then result in, in blood because the animal will not be able to do what we call belching, which is basically like, um, um, releasing the gas through the, the mouth, through the esophagus into the mouth. So that's what happens. So the first animal on the left um, is, is, is mildly blotted. And if you look at it, the left, left rib is, uh, is raised. Then the one in the middle um, is, is moderately, um, moderately blotted. And I, I need you to know that, uh, to understand that the the rumen, which is the biggest part of the rumen and stomach, is on the left. So that's what's, resu what's resulting in, 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 in it um, enlarging the less left side first. Um, then the one on the rightmost is actually severely blotted. So to manage uh, blood, uh, we recommend, because blood comes in two forms, there's what we call frothy blood, which you get when your animals are on lush pastures or those very first pastures. And this is basically managed by products like blood guard, which I know is not on the market, but you can uh, easily use uh, home remedies like you mix green soap with, uh, with water to form a an olive green color that you can drench. You can drench about two liters per animal and it usually clears. Um, but when it comes to free gas blot, which is more common in feed loading, uh, that one may require the usage of a toca and cannula. And I would recommend you to, to work with a, with a qualified uh, veterinarian or a para veterinarian that can assist you uh, or train your, your staff on, on doing that. So in summary, um, I hope I'm within time. In summary, um, these are the activities that we recommend for the induction therapy or for the induction program. Um, so on day one, that's when we do the dipping, um, dosing and tagging for animals. Um, then day five, we do our first um, vaccination and we can do the three in one at that point. 
Then by day 15, we do our um, second vaccination. And at this point, even if we vaccinate, our animals would have adapted and they will, they will, they will be in a better space. They will not be stressed, uh, which may result in, 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 in immunocompromise, in them, in, in them becoming immunocompromised. Um, yeah, um, thank you. And that was my presentation. Well, many thanks uh, there, Dr. Choga, for the great presentation and explaining the importance of uh, maintaining uh, healthy beef, uh, healthy beef cattle, and also uh, the recommendations on how to prevent and treat uh, different cattle diseases and parasites uh, that are common in our country. Before we let you uh, go, Doc, where can farmers find Cooper's Animal Health Products. Uh, so basically, we are um, in Harare. We are at 29 Anthony Avenue. I thought I'd, I'd put the address here. Sorry. Uh, so we are on 29 Anthony Avenue in Masasa. Um, and um, in Buluweyo, we are on number 10 Falcon Street. So basically, we've got those two, 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 two branches. Uh, but we also sell through um, a number of um, agro dealers or vet shops uh, because our model is mainly supplying those um, to sell into the farming community uh, but if there are farmers that would want to purchase from our shops uh, we are open to that uh, but in addition to to products we also um, give what we call after self service where we assist all the farmers that are using our products uh, when they've got any issues, uh, be it to do with animal health, or they want advice uh, on, on any form of new ventures. Um, and basically, we, we help them build their businesses, if I may put it that way, uh, because we can literally walk, 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 walk through with them through their yearly plans and, uh, and things like that. So that's an, an add-on uh, service that we give to all the farmers that we work with. Uh, great. Uh, thank you uh, once again, Doc, for the great uh, presentation. So uh, Cooper's Animal Health are the sponsors of this uh, webinar, uh, the cattle pen fattening webinar. So if you have any questions for Doc, please post uh, in the chat uh, section, then you will be able to attend to, to the questions later on. So now we move on to our next uh, presenter. And also we have just realized uh, that we are oversubscribed and I uh, would like to, to encourage uh, those that are on the waiting list, please, if you know of anyone that is, uh, or anyone who is trying to join and failing, please encourage them to, to uh, join uh, or to follow the proceedings on our Facebook page. We are live on Facebook as well. They can also post their comments uh, there on Facebook and we'll pick the, the questions from there. So if um, uh, Junior Manduna is not on the call yet, we move on to the next presenter is from CC Sales Zimbabwe, uh, Mark Heita, not too sure if uh, he has joined as yet. So we'll move on to the next uh, presenter. She's uh, Blantina Mutago. She's with uh, National Foods and her presentation is on uh, nutrition. So, Blantina, you can go for it. Hello? Yes, Blantina, you can go for it. Okay, thank you very much. How are you, everyone? As you heard, I'm Blantina from National Food Stock Feed, and I will be taking you through fattening nutrition. So, as our previous presenter said, for us to have a vibrant fattening project, these things work hand in hand, meaning from health to nutrition. So in order to have a vibrant project, you should have your cattle in good health or condition. So during pen fattening, cows are usually fed on nutrient-dense nutrient feeds. 
the key nutrients are protein, fiber, and water. So the high energy and protein content feeds are vital for success. But feed costs also constitute of a significant proportion of the variable expense of pain fattening. As such, I'm trying to use mixed on farm or bought in feed has to be made. While home mixed concentrate feed can be more viable than commercial feed, but on farm feeds can be very, very risky too. So the ration should contain grain, forage, and necessary minerals such as calcium, phosphorus, salt, and trace minerals. Additional additives may be needed to improve steel gain, depending on the quality of the grain and hay supplied. Feed contamination in storage by molds, dust, or rodents is a common reason for low dry matter intakes and poor performance and should be avoided at all costs. We have a number of various important nutrients that we need to take into consideration and to also understand what's the importance of these nutrients during pain fattening. To start with, we have fiber. Fiber in beef cattle, are, which are ruminants, and therefore need some fiber in their diets. Hay can meet the demand for fiber, but it is very low in energy and protein. Common sources of fiber include felt hay, wheat or barley straw, silages, snap corn, cotton house, and various crop residues. The other nutrients which is important is also energy. Energy is provided through the breakdown of carbohydrates, protein, and oils or fats within the rumen and the small intestines. Starch is the most common form of carbohydrates and is found in the cereal grains such as maize and barley. Please note, when putting together all these nutrients that I'm talking about, you should use the sound ingredients or raw materials so that you come up with good meals. To go ahead, we also have proteins. Protein is a necessary for muscle development and stimulating appetite. Inadequate protein can lead to a reduction in rumen microbial populations and hence activity. This would lead to a reduction in intake and slower weight gains. Crude protein requirements vary according to the ratio's energy content and the steer's age and life weight. Lightweight cows require higher levels of protein and any given energy intake due to their high requirement of muscle development. Urea is also a cheap form of non-protein nitrogen that the rumen microbes are able to turn into protein for use, but we have to give it at a required percentage to avoid urea poisoning, which is very dangerous to our cows. And it can also lead to high mortalities. So in case you are adding urea, urea can be included in the ration, but should not exceed 2% of the ration and must be incorporated in the grain thoroughly and evenly. Cows under 100 kgs of weight should not be fed urea because their ruminants are still developing. 
if urea is used in the ration, it should be introduced slowly over 10 to 14 days. It must be evenly mixed into the ration. Urea is converted to crude protein by first being converted to ammonia by the rumen microbes. A sudden increase in ammonia concentrations can lead to death. Some feedlots incorporate dried poultry manure into their pen feeds at level of up to 20% of total ration with very good results. However, pre-feeding treatment is essential. The manure needs to be dried and the animals vaccinated, vaccinated against botulism. Then we move on to another nutrient, which is also important and which we also need to put into consideration while we do our mixing of feeds or while we buy our feeds. We also have minerals. Skins need a range of minerals to maintain good health. The minerals are divided into major or macro minerals and minor or trace minerals. Important macro minerals include phosphorus, calcium, potassium, and magnesium. Also, manganese and selenium are among some of the important traces of minerals. So these are the, these are the nutrients that we need to take into consideration while we go through nutrition for pain feeding. We need to make sure that we are feeding a balanced diet to our animals in order to have good weight, in order to have good carcass quality. We need to put this into consideration also, if we are doing a home mixing, we need to make sure that the ratios that we are using for all these nutrients are in good numbers. Also, you are guided by your nutritionist before you mix any feed so that you are guided accordingly. I, I now move on to feeding rate. Feeding rate depend on many factors such as life weight, age and age of the animal. But normally average is between eight to 15 kgs per head per day or 3.5% of life weight. So it's always important to occasionally weigh animals so that when they increase their weights, it means the feed ratio also increases. So we need to occasionally and continuously do our weights. Maybe it can be a weekly weight or a twice a week so that you check if you are still feeding the amount of feed that is required according to their weights. We don't need to underfeed or to overfeed our animals. So for good results, it's important to stick to the feeding ratios that the manufacturer is asking us to follow. An adaptation phase is also important. So this is done for a period of 10 to 14 days in order for the animals to get used to the new profile of nutrition that will be in, of nutrients that will be introducing to them. So in order to avoid stress, we really have to do an adaptation phase, meaning we will be gradually introducing our feed that we will, we will be using to fatten our animals. So we always do a graduation um, an adaptation phase through our fattening. You can say today you give three kgs, then you can add another three, another kg in two days until you are on 14 days where you will now be feeding a full feed that is required by supplier. Meaning by day 14, you must be now feeding that eight to 15 kgs or you'll be feeding that 3.5% of their life weight. So 
at national foods, we have pen feed meal, which we use for fattening of our animals. So normally, fattening will be through 70 to 90 days, though it varies with the type of, of the farmer or the age of the animals that you'll be fattening. But normally, it's between 70 to 90 days. So pen feeding is used to, to fatten our animals and feeding range is 8 to 15 kgs per bed per day. This is our, our fattening meal that we have as national food. So in short, this is what I have on nutrition side. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, many thanks there, Lantina, for the great presentation on uh, the nutrition side of uh, uh, cattle pen fattening. And uh, now we move on to our next uh, presenter. So if you have any questions for Blantina, please do uh, post in the comments uh, in the chat uh, area. And if you are on Facebook, please post on, uh, on the comments uh, section. So uh, we are continuing with this uh, webinar sponsored by Coopers Animal Health Zimbabwe. And uh, our next presenter is um, the next presenter here is um, Mark Benzon, is uh, the team leader of uh, the Beef Enterprise Strengthening and Transformation uh, Project, uh, known as BEST, um, a project under the Zimbabwe Agricultural Growth Program. So, um, uh, Mark Benzon, uh, you have 15 minutes. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for allowing us this time. Can you allow my screen sharing, please? Yeah, I can. Okay. Yes, we have shared from this All right, end. that's fine. We yeah, if we can share from this end, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, sorry for that delay, everybody. Good morning. My name is Mark Benson. I am the team leader for the Beef Enterprise Strengthening and Transformation Project which is uh, funded by the European Union under the Zimbabwe Agricultural Growth Program. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to you about the economics or, or, or how we see um, profitable pen fattening for primarily smallholder farmers. Next slide, please. Okay, the definition of pen, pe cattle pen fattening you've seen uh, earlier on, except that we've modified it slightly. Uh, and I need to, to say to you that this, what I'm gonna be talking about, when you're looking at cattle pen fattening systems, you have two distinct types of, uh, of systems. One is related to the commercial sector uh, and the other is related to smallholder farmers. And there's a very big difference between the two of them. Commercial sector farmers produce cattle and sell them at the optimum time for them to make them as much money as they can. Smallholders, on the other hand, they, they uh, produce cattle uh, for on-farm and home use over probably many years. And then when they're about to die, that's when they want to sell them. And uh, they then want to enhance their value by doing some pen patenting. So you get two distinct systems. One is the commercial one where you're primarily using small, inducting small or younger animals uh, of a good size and weight. And you're expecting to be able to fatten them up to uh, a high level where they can become a, a soup or a choice. Whereas in the smallholder sector, you're just adding value, as much value as you can to whatever you have there. And what we found uh, over a number of years now <clears throat> is that we have for smallholders to make money out of um, pen fattening there's a very small window and that is we believe 45 to 60 days um, under a confined environment and that also improves the slaughter grades and weights and therefore returns and we only do it from the beginning of November or middle of October to the middle of December in order to catch the Christmas market. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, 
Okay, so in the in the feedlot value chain uh, for smallholders specifically, we have a group of farmers who are interested in selling uh, cattle or adding value to their cattle through feeding them, and they want to put them into a feedlot. Inevitably, these guys have very little or no money in, to be able to pay for it, and um, there are various schemes out on the market, such as the MC Meats Feeder Finance Scheme which uh, we feel is a very good way of being able to, uh, of doing it. Um, if, if the farmers don't have access to that, then essentially they have to go and borrow money from an MFI or a bank of some kind. The bank then supplies the feed and the input market or goes to the input market and supplies the farmers with feed and drugs for the induction as well as the feeding. The, the, the feed and the drugs are delivered directly to the feedlot. Uh, and so the farmer doesn't get his hands on the money. At the end of the feedlot period, when the farmers uh, have fed their cattle to, uh, to send them to market, it goes out to the abattoir. And the abattoir then has a link to back to the MFI. They will pay the MFI whatever monies they are owed. And then the balance of the of the money goes back to the farmer group, who then uh, distributed in accordance with uh, how each farmer's animal actually did. Okay, next one, please. So our feedlot criteria, as I said, are quite specific. It's a short duration feeding period, 45 to 60 days pretty much from the 1st of November to the end of December. And the idea is to just hit the festive window, the festive season window when prices peak just before Christmas. So we would anticipate that those cattle are slaughtered between the 5th and the 15th of December so that the meat can get onto the market in time for the Christmas. What we found is that there's Careful selection of cattle is uh, is critical in this system. Because you are dealing primarily with fairly old animals, often very old animals that are coming off no grass because there's nothing around at the end of the year. Um, the communal areas generally have very, very little grass available from July through to the end of November. So these animals are often emaciated, very hungry, they are not, um, they, they, they've been surviving on basically sticks and rocks. So what we're looking for is uh, large framed animals, be they old cows or oxen, because those tend to put on more weight than, than, uh, than old, specifically very old cows that are in the sort of 200 to 300 uh, kilogram range. So we're looking for large framed oxen that, that have an induction weight of at least 300 kilos uh, when they go into the uh, into the pens. Also, obviously, younger steers, zero to four tooth. That's your typical feeder type. They do very well because they uh, they're young and they can they have a high feed conversion ratio. As I said, the larger cow cows, those um, those also have a capability of putting on weight. But all animals obviously have to be healthy, and they have to weigh at least 300 kgs or preferably more. And our aim is to take them from a thin uh, economy or even a, a, a J carcass, which is a, a manufacturing carcass, up to a shiny, well-muscled commercial. And that's where we feel that the farmers get their best and maximize their, uh, their, their returns. And obviously there's a balance between the cold dress mass and the carcass grade. We want to try and increase the mass, but Primarily, we, are, we want to increase the carcass grade because we find that that's where the farmer makes his money, and I'll come to that a bit later. Breed choice, uh, as somebody said just now, is important because um, cross breeds and uh, specific beef breeds tend to have better feed conversion ratios. But pretty much when you are dealing with smallholder farmers, you deal with whatever they bring in. So you've got to try and work with what you can. And... One thing that we found is that you have to be, as I said, careful of the selection of cattle and you have to be able to say no. Because basically these smallholder farmers, they will bring in for, for pen fattening the worst animal that they've got. 
not the best one. So often you have to try and persuade them that that 15 year old cow that's just barely bigger than a goat is not actually going to make them very much money. And that they would be far better off taking that old Madonza, the old uh, ox, which is quite large uh, because it will, it will be able to put on quite a lot more, uh, uh, more meat. And as I say, take the, take the carcass grade up from uh, what it comes in at, um, probably a, a, an emaciated um, manufacturing grade up to a, a commercial. We are not trying to feed these type of animals up to uh, choice or super grades. One, they're too old, they won't make it, even if they are nice and fat. And two, it's, it's something which is pretty much impossible to shoot for with older animals anyway. Okay, next slide, please. So when we're looking at, at the animals that we want to put into feedlots, if you look at the, that old cow on the right there, she's quite small. Um, she's pretty uh, emaciated. You can see all of her bones and her ribs are sticking out. Obviously not a particularly good choice for feedlotting. We would prefer to have larger animals, oxen, uh, such as those on the left-hand side. Those are pretty well muscled now. That's a picture from, um, from one of our feedlots this last year when they were about to go for slaughter. As you can see, they've put on quite a lot of weight. The, uh, the back end of them is quite well rounded and those are very nice commercial carcasses. Next slide, please. So what type of farmers do you bring in or do you put together for a, a pen fattening system? So a bunch of farmers who put together their own pens um, outside of the standard um, pen fattening systems, such as those run by the abattoirs, if they want to do their own, and many of them do, because they, they feel that they don't get a good deal if they send the animals to, to an abattoir directly for, for feeding. They must be willing to work in and as a group and take uh, group responsibility for each other's actions. They must be commercially minded and want to make money. As we all know, out in the communal areas, they are farmers and they are just people who, who live there. And we are looking for the ones who are commercially minded and want to make money from their pen patterning enterprise. They also have to attend to their cattle every day. That's important if they are doing their own feeding and, uh, and watering. Um, we've had situations in the past where farmers have employed people to look after their cattle for them. And sometimes they get fed and sometimes they don't. And they have disappointing results. They must also be work, willing to work with a microfinance institution or whoever your whoever is providing the, the source of uh, the money for the feed, uh, be it the abattoir such as um, MC Meats, if it's a feeder finance scheme or an MFI or a bank. And they must be also willing to contribute their own resources of obviously the cattle in the first place, hay, uh, water, time and energy. And then thereafter, one of the important things is that they must be willing to continue on their own uh, without interaction from a, a developmental uh, partner for their own sustainability in the future. Next one, please. Feedlot site selection in common areas is, is quite important. It must be close to water. Uh, an animal needs between 60 and 100 liters of fresh water per day. And there must be a way of transporting that water to the feedlot. So it should be close to a well or a borehole or something like that. And the farmers must have the commitment to be able to give them the amount of water that they need. You need to allow 15 square meters roughly per, of space per animal in individual or communal pens. And obviously if the farmers are constructing the feedlot themselves, they need to construct a race for handling during induction for dipping and dosing, etc., And then construct feed troughs, water troughs and a water delivery system. Next slide, please.
Okay, the feedlot site selection should also take cognizance of environmental issues. If you are going to be running this feedlot during the during the summer, then you have to be cognizant of where the effluent path is from the feedlot down to uh, down to uh, dwellings and water sources, etc., that are close to the feedlot. So the feedlot should be sited at least 30 meters from dwellings on the downhill side, and also at least 30 meters from a water source, also on the downhill side. If you're not able to do that, then you need to put in drains to ensure that the effluent from the feedlot doesn't enter any water source. Farmers should be encouraged to produce, uh, to, to put fly traps up. There must be some place where they can store the feed and also preferably some area of shade for the animals. Uh, cattle are generally, they don't feed very well if it's very, very hot. They just tend to stand there. So let's have some trees or a shed structure that, uh, or shady structure that helps them uh, to keep cool. Next one, please. Okay, this is, um, this is a cattle business center that we have recently erected in Wenezi at Lapachi Irrigation Scheme. Um, you can see there that uh, there's a cattle handling race with a bale at the far end and a number of pens. Uh, this system is designed for to handle 60 head of cattle at any one time uh, in, a, in a, a pen fattening feeding system. Next one, please. Okay, ideally a feedlot should be close to an all-weather road to allow you access for feed delivery. Um, you also need to construct a loading ramp of some kind so that you can load the cattle onto the uh, onto a, a truck for transport to the abattoir. This is important because if you if you don't, you end up with a rodeo and you end up with cattle that are getting bruised. And obviously bruising is downgraded when they get to the abattoir and the farmers are obviously then disappointed with the results. There must be good security, let's say access for transport to collect the cattle and preferably on a reasonable road because poor roads cause excess bruising, which lowers grade. So the farmers, they load the cattle onto the, onto the truck. Uh, it goes off down a very poor road and they're disappointed when the cattle are slaughtered the abattoir because they have they get downgraded for bruising okay next one please so what's important for management of feedlots the first one is that the farmers need to have some level of enterprise budgeting they need to know what they what their mombi is worth to start off with how much they're going to spend on feed, how much the MFI is going to charge them on, uh, on its, uh, its charges, such as interest, et cetera, and then how much they expect to get out of it at the end, which is obviously not known at, uh, until the, they're actually slaughtered. Induction protocols were covered by Oswin. Uh, it's important that, um, that induction protocols are carried out. Obviously, the last thing you want is to provide a whole lot of nice feed to animals that have issues with diseases or, uh, or, or bugs in, uh, and, and that reduces their, their feeding efficiency. Farmers need to make a decision as to whether they're gonna individually or group feed. Uh, often they feel that they should be feeding individually because they don't want their animal to be, uh, or they, they don't want other people's animals to eat the food that they've now paid for. Watering is important, free water available, minimum of 60 liters, we've said that. They need to have some way of monitoring the weights. If they don't have a scale available by the, the, the abattoir, then they need to monitor the weights by using a weigh band. Um, because it's important that they monitor the weights because any animal which is not gaining weight obviously isn't going to pay for itself in terms of its feed. Animal health is important, we've discussed that. 
obviously you also need to comply with livestock regulations and if they're putting together a um, um, a bunch of cattle for pen fattening they need to observe economies of scale because when you are trying to get an abattoir at just before christmas to come and fetch your whole lot of cattle they're very unlikely to come and fetch three or four or five they want to come with a full truck and fetch up to 20 to 25 although that that is changing that type of system so when farmers put cattle together into pens they should try and get at least 20 animals available for the abattoir to be attracted to come and fetch the cattle often when they do that if there's a lot of them the abattoir will give them a discount on the on the the cost of the transport or sometimes even give it for free next slide please Okay, the profitability of feedlotting, uh, obviously there are many factors which are involved in this. And primarily it's a function of management practices. When, primarily you make money at the point of buying, not selling. And why do I say that? Many farmers have bought cattle from each other and when they go out to buy um, something that they want to pen feed, they'll go and buy the shiniest, uh, fattest looking one that they can because they think that they're going to make more money out of it. Actually, usually the opposite is the case. So when a farmer is actually going out to buy cattle to put into pens, um, he should not be buying the, the fattest, shiniest thing that he can see. He should actually be buying um, a skinny one with the caveat that it needs to be a minimum of 300 kgs and have a big frame so that it can put on, uh, on, on a lot of weight. Farmers who are, who are going to be selling their own cattle through feedlot systems should attempt at least to background the, those cattle. So they should choose the cattle that they want to put in the pens at the end of the year. They should be choosing them around about now. And when the, and that they should also be trying to get locally available feeds such as bush meals or uh, hay from the rangeland or urea treated stuff have something that they can try and uh, mitigate the huge drop in condition that those animals incur towards the end of the year so just try and keep them on not a higher a plan of nutrition but get, feed them something so that when they go into the pens they are not severely emaciated and about to die and to do this, fodder, farmers must learn to grow fodder crops to complement commercial livestock feeds. Commercial livestock feeds, as I'm sure you'll know if you've been to National Foods, uh, they have a landed cost on the farm of around $300 per ton. And many commercial farmers, if you talk to them, they say you don't make money out of pen fattening if you are buying commercial feeds. So primarily, or at least part of the feed system that the farmers are using should be homegrown. Next slide, please. Okay, some numbers. Uh, to give you an idea of what cattle are worth at, at induction, because this is a big question. What is that animal worth to the farmer when he inducts it into the pen? because the difference between that and what it is worth when he takes it out of the pen has a big bearing on whether he actually makes money. So this is uh, from that Lapache uh, Cattle Business Center, the direct sales that we have had from there over the past year. Um, and this is um, Sabi Meats in Cherezi are the private sector partner who's running that CBC. And this is their, their purchases from farmers in that area. So they purchased a total of 592 head and the average price across uh, all four quarters per head has been $267 per animal. And if you look at a farmer when he wants to put an animal into pen fattening system, is he going to get $267 for it if he sells it direct uh, at induction? He will, if he's selling it to a commercial sector partner such as MC Meats or Sabi Meats or whoever it is. 
If he, however, is selling it to the local middleman or the Makoranero or the Magamula, whatever you want to call him, he's likely only to get about half of that because those people want to also sell that Mombi to the abattoir at uh, that $267. So generally, those farmers will only be receiving from the uh, from the middleman around 150 to 200 dollars max for that animal so remember that number 150 to 200 because it has a bearing on the on whether the farmer perceives that he's making money or not so next slide please so this slide shows you the results of our pen fattening system over the past year um, we had three areas where we were pen fattening animals. Primarily, they were they went in at the beginning of November and came out around the 15th or the 20th of December. Muslanguleni is in uh, is in Cherezi. Chanienga is also in Cherezi, and then um, Bohera was the area around Ntusunezita, near to Birchenov Bridge. In total, we fed 223 cattle. And they had a sale value of $117,002, which gives you an average price of $525. Um, the feed value on average was $158. And this was all, it was either MC Meats um, pen fattening meal that they supplied, or in some cases, it was commercial feeds that were bought through uh, an MFI. So $525 is, is the average value of the, of the animal when that was sold. Lesser feed value of 158 means that on average, those farmers made $367. And they were very happy with the results of, uh, of the pen fattening system. Uh, I'll just read you something here that it was a part of a report that came in from uh, from one of my guys. Most of the animals were very thin at induction and were assessed as manufacturing grade, except for five animals regarded as economy. One severely emaciated cow, almost on the point of death, was inducted at 295 kgs live weight and yielded 140 kg commercial grade carcass. And the female farmer took home 390 US dollars after feed deductions. Now that to me is a, is a success. Um, I have some figures which I will share with you. Uh, they came courtesy of MC Meats. They had a, a similar system that they worked on with another a couple of NGOs in 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 the Bohera area, and they were they had mixed results. Generally, if you were able to take a, uh, a J carcass, which is a manufacturing carcass, up to, a, uh, up to an economy, then you made about 100 bucks. If you had a J carcass, which still turned out to be a J carcass at the end, you got $35. And, but if you had a large carcass or a large animal that was more than 300 kgs and you took it from a J to a B, which is a commercial, you could make $400 out of it. So in the one feedlot, the best started at 390 kgs and it was uh, an emaciated manufacturing carcass. It uh, came up to a, um, uh, a commercial carcass and it was 410 uh, and the farmer got $410 net after his food. The worst one was a 276 kg J carcass that was still a J when it went when it finished, and the farmer made six dollars out of it. Obviously, he was very unhappy with that. So, what I'm trying to say here is that the induction criteria need to be rigidly followed, and farmers who try and put a small animal in that is not going to do well because it's ancient and it has no teeth, they, they should be discouraged actively from doing that. Okay, next slide, please.
Right. The, in conclusion, what is the return on investment under pen fattening? Um, this is for our 200 of that we fed this last year. And these are actuals. So if you have an initial value of $150 to $200 per animal, you add $158 of feed, you increase the value to $524 per animal, which gives you a net increase of $366 per animal on average. Farmers, smallholder farmers, when they put animals into pens, they make profit on the grade increase, not the weight gain. Why do I say that? On average, if they feed 12 kgs of feed per day at $300 per ton, then that's $3.60 per day. In the best circumstance, that'll add one kg of live weight or 0.5 kgs cold dress mass, which is what the abattoir pays on. If the abattoir is paying $4 a kg at Christmas CDM for, uh, for a um, um, commercial carcass, then the net return is $2. So it's costing you $3.60 to get $2 back. That doesn't make sense. However, if you have a carcass, which is 150 kgs at slaughter, and it grades economy, it'll be worth $360. That 150 kg carcass, if it grades commercial, will be $465. So there's a $100 difference between an economy carcass and a commercial carcass of the same weight. So that's why I say, Farmers make the profit on the grade increase, not the weight gain. And as I also said earlier, we don't believe that it's worthwhile trying to polish them up to take them from an economy or a manufacturing grade right up to a, um, a commercial, sorry, a um, uh, choice or supers. In order to do that, you need to run for 90 to 120 days and the economics for smallholder farmers at that sort of level is very, very low. Those figures that I gave you for the MC meats system, they were in for exactly 60 days. So they were inducted on the 14th of October and the slaughter date was the 14th of December. So I would, I would consider that in our system, even that 60 days is maybe a little bit too long because um, I don't think that towards the end of the pen fattening cycle that you got a whole lot of weight gain towards the end. Because these animals have a limit on the amount of weight that they're gonna put on. And as I said, it doesn't make sense to feed $3.60 worth of food and then get $2 back. So once you've polished it up from an economy to a commercial, that's where you should actually slaughter it. Okay, that concludes my, uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. I look forward to the questions. I'm sure there's going to be plenty. Well, uh, great. Uh, many thanks there, uh, Mark, for the great presentation. It really showed that uh, cattle pen fattening is uh, very lucrative. And um, thanks again for the success story. Surely there's need to, to unlock the value in livestock production. And our farmers need to understand that uh, the cattle they keep and give names or get attached to actually have value as you have showed in, the, uh, in your presentation. And farmers can make money out of uh, uh, this uh, livestock. So thank you. And our next uh, presenter, is uh, Tamari Mplanga. Uh, she's with the Agribusiness Division of the People's Own Savings Bank. Uh, Tamari, you can go for it. Um, thank you, Rollins. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I'm just going to touch on um, the issues to do with the finance side. 
Uh, let me try and share my presentation. Um, rolling sky and being able, sharing, and I can't share. Oh yes, uh, okay, on it. Can you try now? Okay. Yeah, um, I think it's okay now. Okay, um, I'm sure everyone can see my presentation. Rollins, can you see it? Yes, uh, right. we can now see it, please get on. All right. Um, so as, uh, I'll just um, briefly introduce um, POSB, the brand, and then quickly move on to um, the issues to do with finance. Um, as POSB, we have a dedicated agribusiness uh, um, department that is fully fleshed. It's fairly new, but it offers all the um, it offers all the services to do with our agribusiness finance. Um, and then I think we'll share the presentation so that you have more insight into all of this. So um, moving on, um, I'll just touch on a bit of background on um, issues to do with livestock in the country. So um, at a glance, our country witnesses relatively higher slaughter rates in, um, from August to December of which, it, which is the time when um, cultural activities and festivities are taking place. Um, the statistics show that the proportion of annual slaughters to the total number of cattle is just 5%. Um, this is because generally people do not take um, livestock as a source of income, especially in our rural areas, in the communal areas. Um, and as such, they do not sweat these assets um, that come in the form of cattle. Um, so um, uh, given that, um, I think the previous presenter really showed how lucrative the business of cattle fattening is. And I just, so I just want to um, uh, stimulate thinking around this business for all of our farmers, for all of our attendees here. Um, to see that this is a really lucrative business that if done correctly and as a business, it can really take you, it can improve livelihoods, it can improve incomes. Um, and then research shows that there's a direct relationship between funding and productivity and that access to funding unlocks value. And so it is at the back of this research that um, farmers need to explore the various forms of funding that are available to them. And these are so many, um, there's so many sources of funding that our farmers can look into. Um, all they need to do is make use of the various knowledge platforms that are available, for example, this webinar. Um, so the general sources of funding that are available in Zimbabwe that most of us are well aware of, we have the command agriculture, contract farming, we have our bank loans, we have self-funding, we have the presidential institute scheme, donor funding, and other sources of funding um, that are, uh, are found in, 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 in Zimbabwe. And you'd find that contract farming um, and self-funding are the ones that are contributing the most um, to funding in agriculture. Um, so now I'll just delve deeper into the financial aspects um, to make uh, farmers aware of the eligibility criteria that is used by financial partners, for example, your banks. Um, the, this, the lack of knowledge um, as to what is needed for one to access finance is usually the inhibitor resulting in farmers not being able to access this finance and thinking that it is maybe impossible to access finance. So now you need a prior relationship with the institution, um, for example, your banking institution from where you then hope to access finance to expand your business. Um, by a relationship, I mean the likes of perhaps a bank account. Most banks have low cost, no frill accounts. Um, for example, farmers accounts that farmers can open. These are low cost, meaning they do not cost the farmer much. And they consider the unique cycles um, of the farmer um, that the farmer does not um, earn an income monthly as with other businesses and as such these accounts do not um, demand for monthly uh, maintenance fees like the other accounts and so farmers can 
walk into financial institutions and seek more knowledge about these low cost, no free accounts so that they can at least establish a relationship with the institution so that when the time comes and you feel that you need to expand, um, you have a starting point. The bank has you in their radar. You do not just walk in and say, I'm POSB, Tamari, I need um, a facility. Uh, but you're not known, you're not in the database. So it's very important to have a prior relationship. And then um, you need to have a bankable proposal. By a bankable proposal, I mean a business plan, for example. This does not have to be intricate, does not have to be complex. It can be a very simple proposal that just outlines what you're doing now, what you plan to do in the future, your markets and whatnot. These are points of interest to your financial partner, to your investor, um, as they show that you have a vision and they also show the position where you're at. Um, and also it's a roadmap of where you would wish to be in the future. This is very important. Um, I will just share with Rollins for, for all your sakes, um, a basic draft of a bankable proposal that you would find handy in the future. And this, you do not have to hire a professional to do this for you. It is even more recommended. I strongly usually recommend my farmers to do this on their own so that they should also put the emotion into this proposal so that it can be felt and your vision is shared um, with your bankers or with your prospective bankers as well. And then um, related to the prior relationship is a credit history. You also need to have a credit history, a traceable credit history. Uh, what this means is uh, make um, use of formal channels for your uh, business uh, dealings, for example, for your purchases, um, try and uh, make use of the formal channels so that you have records of this and this can be traceable as well. Um, and then you need your budget. I think the previous presenter spoke about the key tenets of cat uh, pen fattening and one of them was the um, need for enterprise budgeting. So you definitely need your budgets to give you a clear picture of whether what your the business that you plan on entering into will give you returns or it is a loss making venture. And this is very important because sometimes you'd spend your resources, both financial and human resources, dwelling on a project that is not giving you um, any return in the end. So it is very important for you to sit down, um, make a list of your revenue and then of your revenues and then make a list of your costs and then see if you're left in the positive if you're left in the green or in the red this is also very important and um your financial partners and financial institutions are also very interested in um these budgets as they also help them to buy into your vision to show that no this is a lucrative vision and you'll be able to repay um, the loan that they would have granted to you. Then there's also the issue of your cash flows. Now, these are a reflection of the amount of money that will be flowing in and out of your business. And this is also a very necessary tool that will enable you to make a successful bid for funding. So you need to have uh, cash flows. Also for the benefit um, of all the attendees here, I'll also share um, um, template of this tool of the budget and of your cash flows and of your bankable proposal so that in the future when you decide to expand your your business and you decide to do this using borrowed funds then you have what you call your cash flows as well and then i also spoke about the traceable credit history which also speaks you also need to have your traceable records what i mean is that you need to have somewhere where you're recording all your inflows and where you're recording all your all your outflows um this is very important as it also uh, helps you to share what is going on with your banker because the word of mouth um, will not capture everything even for you. And this is also important even besides for the benefit, for the sake of accessing funding. It's also important for you to be able to then know that um, for the past um, so-and-so period, I've made a loss, I've made a profit, I should improve once. X and Y areas. So um, uh, you can also invest in software if you're the most sophisticated type, but you can always just record your every single thing, your expenses, your sales, your um, um, all of this, uh, you can record it in a simple format. And then um, 
another requirement for for one to access um, uh, funding is collateral. Obviously, uh, banks need to have uh, to have an alternative um, way of um, uh, collecting their funds in the event that um, the project does not um, produce the expected results. Uh, so. I think this usually is a train smash for our farmers, especially our um, small scale farmers who do not have the mostly acceptable collateral, which is immovable security. And as such, I'll just introduce to you several other forms of collateral that are being explored in this country that are actually being accepted so that these are not a hindrance to our farmers, to our viable farmers from um, accessing finance. Um, we have, for example, offtake agreements, wherein the farmer has an offtake agreement from a reputable, um, from a reputable uh, entity, for example, your Qualcomm and other well-known, uh, uh, well-known buyers um, of, 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 for example, your beef. Um, when you have this agreement and it's signed and sealed, then this can act as um, collateral for your facility, wherein the bank knows that there is a guaranteed market for the product that you're going to be producing. And as such, the form of payment can be ring fenced. The funds, there's no way that the funds will then be diverted. There's, in the agreement, there'll be a clause to say the funds will go to bank so and so. Um, the, the proceeds from the sale of beef will go to bank so and so. Then um, this is um, the same as, uh, this is the same concept as contract farming. Then you have your insurance. I would like to emphasize the importance of insuring one's cattle as this also is another form of security that is being explored by financial institutions. Um, I know the cost in this country may be inhibitive, but um, when, for example, you approach insurance um, companies as groups or in your groups or as members of an association, then you can negotiate for lower rates so that um, your cattle are insured. It's even an advantage to you as the farmer so that in the case of outbreaks, um, for example, you're also covered. You do not lose um, all of your investment. So this is very important, not only for access to financial um, products, but also for you, the farmer, because we do know that um, uh, the factors that are uncertain that are, cannot be controlled, and as such, that's the need um, for insurance. Then there are issues of proper tagging and ID documentation. This will also help so that um, your cattle can even be used as collateral, as this is also acceptable to some financial institutions. And so when your cattle are properly tagged and properly ID'd, and you're adhering to your dipping schedule and there, there's documentation to show this. This is also um, a very important factor in considering the use of your livestock as collateral. Then um, I'm always encouraging farmers to be part of an association. Do not be a one-man band. Um, join an association. The advantages of this, um, of joining an association are so many. They, um, for example, you have access to organized finance where in your if your organization approaches the bank it is easier for them to extend a facility to the association which will then on land to the um, members why because this association um, has better knowledge of its members and as such the bank for example will feel um, more confident in extending facilities to to a fully fledged association. So I always encourage um, farmers to respect to, to join respective associations so that they have better access to um, facilities. And also you have a pool of knowledge from joining an association wherein um, the association is always uh, gathering knowledge on production trends, on financial trends, if there are disease outbreaks expected of, or if there are disease outbreaks, how one is to handle these disease outbreaks. So you have, um, um, a limitless source of information by joining an association. And so I always encourage farmers to um, subscribe or to be affiliated to an association. And then there's also the issue of lobbying, you'll be able to lobby better, say for interest rates to be reduced if you're part of an association and be able to benefit from, um, from such things. And then um, I just go on to the types of funding um, that are offered um, industry-wide with equity, which is basically how 
one starts um, using own contribution, for example, uh, maybe contributions from a family as a family, just contribute and use your own funds. Usually this is what we encourage because to be honest, um, green, greenfield financing is not um, available in this country at the moment. It may be available, but it's extremely limited as banking institutions. Um, we are not um, confident in lending to a green field. So what I always encourage is that one starts where they are. If you start with say um, just two beasts and um, you go from there and then you then come to the bank and say, look, now I have five beasts. I'm looking to expand now. That is something that you can sell. So equity is where one starts. So I always encourage to say, start where you are and then borrow for growth, right? You do not borrow to start. And then um, we have debt, which is now where you move on from to say, I'm now expanding, I'm now diversifying and the like. So um, debt is where we come in as banks, um, uh, providing your overdrafts, your capital expenditure, um, or the finance and the like. Um, so you have, also have to be very careful um, as to the type of funding that you make use of. Like I said, when you're starting, it is not recommended to start by borrowing. It becomes very expensive because now you're incurring interest charges when you're not yet earning any income. And so it is recommended to um, make use of equity. And then when you now want to expand, you then um, go on to borrow because you can now afford the interest and so forth. Then um, key tenets of debt funding. Um, I just like to talk about this so that our farmers are aware that debt is not um, donor funding. When you borrow, you're required to repay. And what this means is that when you borrow for a certain purpose, you need to make use of the funds for that purpose that you specifically outlined to avoid issues of um, then defaulting and, um, and the like. So there's repayment source. Um, banking banks, for example, are very interested in how the funds will be repaid. When this is clearly outlined in your proposal, then you'll find that it's much easier for you to sell your, your proposal. And like when the repayment source is fishy, or that is why I always encourage the issue of optic agreements, start with your market and then move backwards to say, when I produce my beef, I'll sell, I'll sell it to so and so, and then you move backwards because this also gives comfort to your financial partners. Then there's an the issue of security, which is collateral, which I've already alluded to. Then there's also the issue of trust or relationship. So in any relationship, there if there are trust issues, then that, that, that relationship does not sell smoothly. So when your banking partner trusts you, when they have knowledge about you, even when you borrow and you're facing challenges, you should always engage your banker to say, look, I'm facing so and so challenges and not wait until the funds are due. And then you start saying, but I face this and that. Always be in touch with your banker. Always be in touch with your financial. Even if it's a donor, always be in touch with them so that you, you, they are well aware of where you are. And then only like I alluded to earlier, only borrow to growth. Do not... Um, borrow to start and do not borrow to fund your wages and salaries, only borrow for growth. I have to emphasize this because this means that you'll be able to generate enough to repay this borrowing. Then my the golden entrepreneur rule that I always like to leave because cattle fattening is a business like any other such until you know value, everything is worthless. So as I alluded to earlier that um, the cattle that are, are, are kept in our communal areas, for example, sometimes the full value is not realized. They are not um, are fully valued as they should be. And the assets are not uh, being, uh, you know, we're not sweating our assets as, 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 as estimation. Um, I think um, that's the end of my presentation. My details are on the last slide. Thank you so much. Great, many thanks uh, Tamari for uh, that great presentation. So the uh, key points uh, from your presentation and uh, I'm sure farmers uh, you've taken note a good relationship with uh, uh, 
uh, POSB is key to financing your project. And also uh, it is important to always start small and borrow to grow your project. So um, if you want uh, Tamari con uh, Tamari's contact details, you also share in the uh, chat section. So our next presenter uh, is from the best project. Right, just, just a minute there. Oh yes, okay, done. So the next presenter is um, from the best project and uh, unfortunately because of our time, uh, we are giving him only uh, 10 minutes max. Is uh, Onyas Mutetwa, that is uh, the private sector engagement specialist. Onyas, you can go for it. All right. Um, thank you very much and good morning, uh, everyone. I am happy to be the last presenter, so I will not take long. Can you help me? All right, thanks. My, my name is uh, Onyas Mtetwa. I am from the Beef Enterprise Strengthening and the Transformation Project. We acronym it BEST, which uh, falls under the Zimbabwe Agricultural Growth uh, Program an EU funded value chain uh, uh, project. I will present on the ZAGP experience in the beef value chain. Next slide. All right, th th thank you. Uh, my, my discussion points, uh, I will look at uh, just a quick overview of the ZAGP based project. Then we discuss um, the CBC model. Uh, I'll also talk about private sector engagement and participation in the uh, project, stakeholder uh, co and community engagement or support. Then I will um, discuss quite um, at length on the further production. Then uh, pen fattening has already been covered. Then I'll look at the policy and governance issues on, on assets because uh, to me it's, a, it's an issue of, of importance. So just a quick about the ZHGP based project. It is um, an EU funded beef value chain project, which is uh, implemented in partnership with the government of Zimbabwe. We have World Vision as the lead partner in a consortium of uh, three implementing partners. The other partners are WH, WHH, World Hunger Youth, which is a um, former German agro action, and the a local partner, Sustainable Agriculture Technology, and the, a number of private sector uh, companies, which makes our project a bit unique. Um, the main goal or objective of the project is to improve the production and productivity of the uh, beef sector in Zimbabwe. We are covering 10 action districts under five provinces in the country. And uh, our signature model as the ZAGP based project is called the Kettle Business Center model. Um, a cattle business center, I would say, it's a, it's a hub where all beef value chain actors will converge at a central or strategic location in uh, any of the 10 action districts. We have 10 of these, which means one per district. Um, and in each district, we have five additional satellite cattle business centers that will service areas that are uh, within 40 to 50 kilometer radius from the main cattle business center. The, the structure or layout of a cattle business center is in such a way that uh, um, we, we have a 60 head feedlot facility 
where farmers or beef producers who bring their animals for 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 fattening they also come to access other beef value chain services like uh, purchase of uh, veterinary drugs they will also access stock feed for their uh, breeding stock at home we also have uh, a fodder production uh, component at every cattle business center we are targeting a minimum of uh, one hectare to demonstrate the uh, various uh, fodder crops from legumes and, and grasses so that farmers will learn from there. We'll also use the same fodder plots as uh, seed multiplication points for farmers to come and they access seed to, to produce their own fodder at home. We also want to uh, take advantage of uh, the locations of these uh, areas to try and support small to medium scale uh, beef producers. Our intention is to address issues to do with nutrition, uh, access to uh, market information, access to extension uh, and the advisory services, um, and also uh, produce a, a business environment where all the players will uh, interact and interact. Next slide, please. The project has um, established the infrastructure at uh, the Kettle Business Center. Like I indicated, we have a 68 feedlot facility. We also have um, a five uh, office block, which is an office for the private sector company that runs the, the or manages the cattle business center. We have an office for the local extension staff. We have an office for the best project staff. We also have um, a drug storeroom, which will be equipped by a small refrigerator uh, so that we maintain a cold chain for vaccines and other veterinary drugs that need uh, to be kept cold. Um, we also have, um, for each uh, province of the five provinces, we have a tractor and a, a, a bale or hay making equipment. So uh, this uh, allows uh, the, the cattle business center to be able to harvest the hay even from, from, from the field and store at the cattle business center for sale late in the dry season. We have um, a solar, we, we, are, we are drilling or have drilled the solar uh, powered balls on each of the 10 cattle business centers to try and promote uh, green energy. We are using solar. And the, our offices are also solar powered. We want to operate off grid. And we just want to demonstrate that to the farmer. They can do that without uh, connectivity to uh, disaster grid. Of the 10 cattle business centers, we have two unique ones. Uh, that uh, is a pasture production facility. The first one is Lapachi, which is uh, in Mwenezi, just uh, close to Rutenga. It uh, is a 35 hectare uh, for the production facility under center pivot. Currently, we are operating at 50%, uh, which is 17 hectares because uh, Part of the area is a very uneven terrain, which requires heavy machinery to be level. We could not do it uh, this summer because of the uh, wet weather. We will finish off the other half uh, this uh, winter, so that by next year, we are, by end of the year, we are able to operate at uh, 35 hectares. We also, the second one is in Palu, which is Umguza district, uh, just 35 kilometers out of Bulawayo along the Victoria Falls Road. It is um, a 50 hectare, it's, it's, it's big and massive, 
uh, pasture facility again under center pivot. Uh, currently, this summer we, we planted um, 27 hectares. The, the idea is to produce the, the fodder, really it into hay for sale to uh, farmers. Next slide, please. We, we have a private sector um, engagement uh, component where we invited private sector companies to come and partner with us because why are we inviting the private sector? We, we are saying uh, private sector companies um, are, are, are business oriented. Since we want to improve the production and productivity of, um, of the, the beef uh, value chain, we want to bring in people uh, that have uh, a business acumen to run the cattle business center uh, on a commercial basis. So we have 10 um, companies that we invited and the, they showed willingness to partner with us to run this. Uh, the, the basis for, for our selection was uh, past experience or current experience in uh, beef production and the similar or related uh, to the business center model. So for the 10 partners we are working with, we have MC Meat, they are in Chiredzi. Then we have uh, Sabi Meats, they are in Mwenezi. We have Balu Pican in Umguza Balu. We also have Outback Safari in um, um, Martinot, again, Lupani District. We have Bellevue Abato. We also have Pepper or Investment. We are also happy uh, that we are partnering very well with Tonga Tulets in um, in Menezi district because they are just close to Lapachi. As part of their corporate social responsibility, they offered to support the project with their land preparation and land leveling at Lapachi. We also work with Windmill, uh, Prime Sitco, National Foods, and Leguminosa. These are mainly input suppliers. Windmill is providing uh, us with the training. If you check one of my photos, there's windmill uh, training in Chiredzi. All the say, two banners that are pitched uh, on that uh, day are for windmill. They were conducting a training on urea treatment of stova, and they were also um, meeting farmers uh, in Chiredzi in preparation for um, the hosting the, the, the pen fattening because they are the ones that provided the stock feed for the, for the feed lotting uh, project. We also have first mutual finance, microfinance. They are um, our microfinance firm who supported with pre-financing stock feed. They paid for the stock feed well in advance to national food and the, they recovered their uh, uh, monies at the point of, uh, of sale after the, the pen fattening cycle. We also work with the Minister of Agriculture, especially Agritech's vet, in the extension uh, training mobilization of uh, farmer groups. Um, then we also work with the Minister of Local Government. They are key uh, in the regulatory and, and policy uh, governance issues because um, they are the ones who uh, help us in the, uh, resolving disputes. Um, next slide. We, we, we cannot uh, operate without uh, the community because uh, the community are the farmers that we are servicing. So when we were establishing the cattle business centers, the community contributed uh, firstly by providing land uh, for the project. Consider uh, Apache, we, we wanted 35 hectares for, for, for the pasture facility. Again, up there in Balu, uh, Umguza, we wanted uh, 50 hectares for, for the pasture. They also provide labor and other available material like sands, uh, stones, 
etc they are our major uh, stakeholder because they are the beef producers who are providing uh, cattle at the uh, feedlot facility and the cattle business center they also are part of our off taker because they will come in buy fodder they buy stock feed and drugs they also demand the other beef value chain services at the at the cbc we also have a, what we call a, a cattle business center committee which is which comprises of farmer representatives more like a, a, a cbc level beef producers association that will coalesce to a district a, uh, beef producers association provincial up to uh, national uh, beef producers association is one of our, our our deliverables that we 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 need to ensure we have a strengthened beef producers association at national level at the end of the project achievement so far we have identified uh, private sector companies who are managing the 10 cat business centers we also uh, have uh, gained a lot of stakeholder buy-in and the, they are providing us with the, both the administrative and technical support in uh, running this project. Uh, so far, we have three cattle business centers which uh, managed to successfully run one cycle uh, of uh, pen fattening under feeder finance in 20. Uh, 20. Uh, Lapache managed to harvest uh, 4,358 4, hay bales that were sold um, to uh, farmers. They are open to anyone. And Balu, like I indicated, has uh, planted 26 hectares of roads. Uh, it's a combination of three uh, varieties, uh, species of fodder uh, uh, plants. But uh, while we, 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 we celebrate the achievements, we also have challenges. The establishment of majority of our CBCs was slow, especially uh, because of uh, COVID lockdown uh, restrictions. We also have uh, limited financial services uh, uh, sector participation because uh, our approach is a bit unique. They are, they, 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 uh, microfinance firms are not used to uh, our type of, of of business so we are still engaging them to make a custom made um, finance facility or loan facility that suits the kind of farmers we are working with we also have challenges on hay making due to persistent wet weather uh, this summer and it results in a, in a quite a, a substantial loss of production. I was also saying our project is, uh, is, a, is short, but it's four, it's four years, considering the production cycle of uh, a beef animal. You know, you, 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 you waste or you spend the first one and a half to two years on preparatory work. When you start uh, now into production, you are at a, year number two, you would want to see the, 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 the production cycle continue because we also have a, a breeding component. Hi, um, Fortune. Fortune, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yes. My apologies, uh, because of our uh, time, uh, yes. uh, we may have to attend to the farmers' questions now uh, before the other present, uh, presenters leave the uh the meeting but we you can make an arrangement to host uh the basic program uh for the next program uh for the next uh webinars to come and also to share the presentations uh or your presentation rather with uh the audience okay thank thank, thank you thank you very much uh, once again thank you for according us uh, an opportunity to present our experiences as ZGP best project. Uh, back to you, sir. You are welcome. Uh, thank you uh, very much for that uh, presentation. And we really appreciate uh, the efforts in, in, in assisting farmers in that migration from um, subsistence to commercial. 
uh, farming when it comes to uh, beef production. So uh, we'll quickly go into the questions that we uh, have uh, from the chat section. Um, and would like to uh, would like to encourage you to follow um, the Coopers Facebook page and also other social platforms. Uh, we have posted the links in the in the chat group. So Coopers uh, Animal Health Animal Health they are the sponsors of uh, this webinar. Um, they made it possible for us to uh, interact. So the first question is for Dr. Choga uh, from Coopers. It say, it's saying here, is it really necessary to consider the breed uh, when starting a pen fattening project? And um, the same person had two questions. Uh, the other one is uh, vaccination only ends on day 15. It's, um, it's a question again. Oh yes, so he had responded in the chat uh, section. Uh, he says, in response to your praise, breed certainly plays a role in feedlotting. There are specific breeds uh, such as Beefmaster, Cemental, uh, and other composite breeds. Uh, these are the key aspect. The key aspect to look at is the frame of the animal, as most animals are crossed uh, in commercial producers. Then also he said, uh, yeah, beef pro if producing breeds mentioned above and the more uh, others will definitely add value if used as a base, uh, either as cows or as the bull from young, from your long winner feed uh, steer supplier. So in terms of vaccination, he says on day five, you do three in one and on day 15, the lumpy vax from Coopers. So that was uh, Dr. Choga's response. Then uh, question two says, Dr. Choga, how are you? In case your animals are coming from tick-free areas or environments, how do you go about the blocking process? What's the recommended doses? Uh, doses? Okay, so he responded, yes, saying, in cases where your animals are coming from a tick-free area, you just need to deworm, treat with cupamycin, um, or equivalent and vaccinate with Lampivax and three in one vac uh, vaccine. In cases where you have vaccinated, you may not need to vaccinate. Then the other question is we need more information on the best program. Okay, uh, on the best program, uh, their success stories, are you going to host them in the future? Yes, uh, we engage um, uh, the best uh, project representatives. Uh, on that uh, question. Then uh, the, the following question here, can we have, can we get this information from local national foods depots or offices perhaps? That's for Blantina. Blantina, are you on the call to answer that one? Okay, so yeah, I'm sure we can arrange with uh, national foods uh, for that. And if you need any uh, of the presentations that we had today, just send your just to type in your email address in the chat section, we'll compile the email addresses and you should be able to receive a recording of uh, this program in the next few days. Then what are the recommended fodder crops in Zimbabwe, Matebeleland in particular? Uh, Plantina is no longer on the call. Um, Mark Benzon, are you able to take that one? What are the recommended fodder crops in Zimbabwe, Matebeleland in particular? Okay, thank you. He, for, for, for us, we, we, we have two uh, models that we are using. Unfortunately, we are doing it under, under irrigation for the grass crops. We are, we are growing uh, roads reclaimer grass. Roads reclaimer grass, is, the, the botanical name for this is uh, Chloris Guyana. We we are also we are also um, doing finger grass. Uh, we are the finger grass is called the uh, smart finger grass and wild buffalo grass. Those are the the three grasses that we are using. But uh, for dryland, we we are also promoting under 
a farmer field school demonstration plots. We, we, are, we are promoting for the, for the uh, legumes, yeah, mainly the velvet bean mukuna and the, the dolicos lab lab. Um, the third crop is um, cow pea. Then the, the grass we are promoting at uh, household or farmer level under dryland is the forage sorghum. I think that's that's it for the for the crops that we are we are promoting and are for the production. Ah, that's yeah, hi, I'm here. Ah, great, thanks, uh, Mark. Okay, uh, the other question there for you is, um, hi, Mark Benso. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for your presentation. You mentioned that farmers make more profit when their animal change uh, grade compared to weight gain. This is important. In your introduction, you mentioned following introduction protocols as one of the major determinants uh, in farming, in improving carcass grade. How best can this message be conveyed or shared with uh, smallholder farmers? Uh, it was uh, covered in the first presentation by Oswin Choga very well. So it, it's really, you need to follow the protocols that he's talking about. Um, you will find that if it's, uh, if it's someone like MC Meats or someone who's doing a feed of finance scheme, that uh, they're aware of all of the necessary protocols as far as doing the, the dosing, the dipping, etc., are concerned. And also the uh, induction regarding uh, not feeding them too much of the main uh, feed until the rumen is actually adapted to to the higher um, the higher nutrient feed, so it's all out there. Um, Oswin has got a good presentation on also the national foods levy. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, then the other one is uh, hi Mark. What are the key success uh, factors uh, in cattle pen fattening? I think you covered this uh, as well, or maybe is asking for for just a summary. Take a big skinny animal and polish it up from, uh, so that it becomes a commercial. Unless you're a commercial farmer, in which case you take your, your young stock at 300 kgs uh, minimum entrance weight and you can polish them up over 90 days or 120 days to become uh, supers. Uh, great, uh, thank you. Then uh, what's the reasonable number of cattle that one can start with? Uh, that's like how long is a piece of string? There's no such thing as... <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking, if you're talking about pen fattening, uh, specifically then you need to have the, the, the starting number of cattle needs to be what will attract a commercial sector partner to come in and buy the cattle on site. Um, and that is, in traditional systems, 25 to 30 head. Uh, if they have smaller trucks, now a lot of the abattoirs have smaller trucks that run around. It can be anything from 15 head upwards. Uh, but the most important thing is to commit to having them there. What these guys do not want to find is that they make an arrangement to come and fetch 25 cattle. And when they get there, there's three or four that really doesn't make them uh, very happy with it. And they and their transport cost is very, very high in relation to the cattle that they're getting. <laughs> so it's important to have that relationship with them, especially at the time around Christmas. And the reason I say that is because they are all fattening their own cattle at that time of the year, because they also want to take advantage of the market around Christmas. So before you even put the cattle into the pens, you need to have an arrangement with a private sector partner, the, the abattoir who's going to take them. Because if you do not book them in for the Christmas market, then they will turn around to you and say, ah, sorry, we are full up. We can't slaughter any more. Because that is the only time of the year that, they, that their abattoirs act at capacity. Because they're trying to get all this nyama onto the market for the, uh, for the Christmas period. So one of the things we found is that it's important to have a relationship with a commercial sector, uh, with, a, with an abattoir who's going to, who, who has uh, 
given you a commitment to take the cattle and then you need to stick to that commitment thank you oh great uh thank you then uh the other one i think uh this one is for national foods can we get this information from uh, the local national foods depot uh depots offices uh, perhaps national foods if you are in, if you are on the call oh okay as national foods we have quite a number of distributors that distribute our feed and these are gain patient carry you can also get our feeds in in Richard okay okay or okay mart and pick and pay also to those who want our technical support we have a technical team that always that are always in the field who assist farmers on feeding mixing of feeds so if you want help on that one, you can also get in touch with me. I'll drop my phone number on the message section so that you can get in touch with me and we assist each other. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, thank you for attending to that question. Then the other one is for uh, POSB. Uh, the question is, is there an ongoing credit scheme for farmers at the moment? If so, uh, what are the rates? Um, okay, thank you for that. I think we lost uh, Tamari there. Okay, so this uh, presentation will also be published in our next edition. That's uh, the February edition of uh, the Agribusiness Magazine. So also uh, try and get questions uh, or answers rather to the questions that you have uh, posted because of our time we um, we have to end the meeting now uh, in so i'd like to thank uh, everyone who has uh, participated and farmers thank you very much for joining uh in this webinar and we hope you have learned uh, a lot uh, in terms of uh, the business of uh, cattle pen fattening the key su success factors the nutrition side and financial side uh, and also the work that uh, the best program is doing and with a great uh, with great presentations from uh, our presenters today uh, thank you very much and special thanks to our sponsor Cooper's animal health please do follow uh, their social media uh, platforms and please do support the products uh, whenever you need any animal health uh, products please visit uh, their web address and also their social media pages for more information. So thank you very much, farmers. We have to end the meeting now. 